The SDF-1 and her crew, along with the people of Macross City, stood as the only buffer between the planet Earth and not only Britai's imposing fleet of Zentradi ships and warriors, but an even grander fleet still, lurking somewhere far off in the galaxy, under the watchful eye of Supreme Commander Dolza. There was no need to send his full force to capture Zor's battle fortress from the Micronians. Ritai, Azonia, and Chiron should be more than enough. Yet, it had taken longer than Dolza had ever ventured to guess. Still, the reports came in from Britai and his subordinates, the latest showing a great power that some Micronian warriors seemed to harbor, even without their Robotech mecha. That, mixed with the energy field Dolza had seen previously, and the effects of Micronian behavior and culture, the threat of it on the Zentradi way of life, caused Dolza much concern. On the front lines, within Britai's own flagship, the newly found fan club of Minmays was reaching cult-like status. As Rico, Conda, and Braun continued to share their many anecdotes and stories of the Micronians, and show off their collection of goods, the most popular of which was the singing Minmay dolls, which entranced the giant warriors. So, this is what they call singing, huh? I think I like it. Is it true we could hear the real singer if we became spies and lived among the Micronians? That's the truth. As a matter of fact, when you hear the real singer, you'll probably like her more than this doll. Oh, this singing really makes me feel funny. Just wait until you hear the next song. You mean there's more than one? And we heard a song. A song? What's that? It's a way Micronians make each other feel good, and there were two songs inside this little doll. It sounds fantastic. Can we hear it? Rico's got it. Come on! Yeah, let's go! You guys gotta hear this. You gotta hear this. On Chiron's ship, he listened as Grell notified him on the rumors and whispers running rampant through the fleet of the power of this little doll the three spies to the Micronians had brought back. Chiron certainly wasn't worried about any doll, but Grell reiterated the doll was sparking notions of defection in the Zentradi ranks. Defection? To the Micronians? Preposterous! Even if these were just rumors at this point, it certainly served to drive Chiron's desire to see the battle fortress and its people destroyed once and for all. Yet, Chiron and Grell could never have guessed just how very true all of these rumors were. This group of Zentradi were practically worshipping Minmay and the idea of living in Micronian culture at this point. An announcement to report to battle stations was made, and this group began to truly worry that if they attacked the battle fortress, there was a chance the real Minmay could be killed, the Micronian city destroyed. Rico longed to show his Zentradi brethren the wonders he, Conda, and Braun had experienced. It was then and there he made a monumentous decision. During their next attack, they should sneak off away from the battle and just live with the Micronians. Well, the very idea could be treasonous and would mean their execution if they were caught. But Rico, Conda, and Braun, bound together in supporting this idea, no, it's a risk worth taking. Immediately, all of their cohorts chime in, desiring to join this effort. But the trouble is, they were still gigantic compared to Micronians. They'd need someone who knew how to operate the chambers to micronize them to human size. A soft-spoken warrior named Corita, small and timid by Zentradi standards, hems and haws when asked to run the machine that would reduce the size of his fellow soldiers. It takes some convincing from Kanda and Braun's promise that Karita can keep all these Micronian possessions for himself before he agrees to help them in their dangerous plot. During some quiet time back on SDF-1, Rick wandered the ship sorting out his own thoughts. 
Still troubled over the losses of Roy and Ben, he literally bangs his head, wondering if their deaths had any meaning, if his life does, if he was doomed to go out in battle the same as them. As he moves through the corridors with a heavy heart, he stumbles across the Minmate posters someone had hung up. Although he'd had a lot of mixed emotions concerning her recently, he felt the spark of what originally motivated him to become a fighter pilot, a soldier, that desire to protect his loved ones. Feeling the spark reignite the flame of duty inside him, he steeled himself for whatever trials and battles lay ahead, inspired once again by Lin Min Mei. Min Mei's effects weren't only felt by Rick at this time. She was holding a concert in the city, her music and words of love and peace permeating not just the venue, but all over the ship. Vanessa, Kim, and Sammy swooned at the idea of finding the kind of love Min Mei sang of, but Kim noticed Claudia and Lisa were hearing the song differently. They were sure Claudia must be thinking of the late Commander Foker at this time, and they were correct in that assumption. Claudia allowing herself to remember some of the tender times she and Roy had shared. Well, if Claudia was certainly thinking of Roy, who would Lisa have been thinking of, the girls wondered quietly. It depended on the moment. As close as she'd grown to Rick recently, Lisa was still caught up in this idea of Lynn Kyle, his words of peace over war, of pacifism over violence, still caught her ear and her heart, reminding her of Carl Reber, who was taken from her so long ago. But whomever it was Lisa's thoughts turned to at this time, even Claudia could only really guess, but she could see the turmoil in Lisa's heart. As the applause to Min Mei's encore permeated the amphitheater in Macross City, her countenance beaming under the adoration of thousands, Kyle couldn't be more proud of her, more uplifted, more attracted to Min Mei and the woman she'd become. One of the greatest minds in the Zentradi forces was the small and unassuming Exodor. While not much as far as size or strength went, the vastness of his knowledge and analytical skills cast a shadow larger than a Zentradi battlecruiser. In his analyses of all the data gathered from the three spies, as well as previous battles with the Micronians, Exodor presented a plan to Britai one which would use the Micronians' most ingenious and clever tactics against them. Ritai's warrior heart stirred as Exodor relayed this plan, knowing that this would be it. The masterstroke that captured Zor's battle fortress and would guarantee Zentradi dominance in the galaxy forever. Hundreds of battle pods were lined up, waiting for this next attack to begin, most warriors waiting patiently, eager for battle, but some tiny warriors were eager for very different reasons. There were dozens and dozens of battle pods with micronized Zentradi, all scattered among the many waiting to attack. From his own flagship, the first wave of battle pods were ready to launch this assault, all led personally by Chiron the Backstabber. The crew of the SDF-1 reads as many as 30 ships breaking from the enemy fleet to move towards the battle fortress, and Captain Glovel gives the order to launch all fighters. Rick gets Skull-1 ready for flight and heads out, leading the host of Veritex to defend the ship against Chiron and his forces. As the attack begins, Ritai and Exodor watch as all the pieces fall into place, exactly as predicted. 
Britai orders his battle cruisers to begin encroaching on the battle fortress, taking great care to keep Britai's own flagship conspicuously in the leading center position as they move in to weapons range. The attack of the Zentradi fleet is fierce, the SDF-1 taking several direct hits, rattling those inside. With the Veritex holding off battle pods in all quadrants around the ship, Global determines a Daedalus attack would be best, a way to thin the herd of battle cruisers coming at them. He surmises if they can destroy their lead vessel, it should send the others scattering to where the SDF-1 could clean them up with shots from its rail guns, or even the main gun, as they move away from the Veritex field of engagement. Rico, Braun, and Conda go over their own plans once again, spreading the word to the other would-be defectors. While the battle continues to intensify, its effects are felt even within Macross City, where the concert goers in Minmei recoil as the battle fortress quakes around them. Kyle leaps onto the stage, urging Minmei to keep calm and keep singing, knowing it will inspire the people. Minmei finds her bravery and does as she's bid, losing herself in her music as she fills the people of Macross with courage and hope. Kyle stands even more amazed at this gift she has. Ritai's forces draw ever nearer, but the SDF-1 and the Daedalus are ready. Plunging the supercarrier into Britai's ship, just as it had with Zareel's, the front end of the Daedalus stops inside, exactly where Exodor had predicted. The complement of Spartan destroids that burst forth are immediately dispatched by the dozens of battle pods waiting for them. The battle pods move quickly, entering the loading ramp of the Daedalus. Although Braun, Conda, and the others are among this attack wave, the rest begin wreaking havoc as they make their way into the ship. One brave injured soul is able to get out a warning, as Claudia informs Captain Glovel, who hears it as the most dire news he's ever received. It isn't long before the battle pods make it to Macross City and march through, blasting away at everything in sight. The destroids patrolling inside taking heavy casualties against this assault. Lisa informs Rick, requesting his flight group to enter the ship and help defend the civilians. Rick just hopes they haven't made it to the amphitheater, where most of the citizens, where Minmay, would be. He and Max are led inside the ship through a hatch which opens for them, but are closely pursued by Chiron, who also makes his way in. The bridge receives an endless stream of requests for backup, status reports of chaos and destruction at an unimaginable level, and Lisa worries if Kyle is okay, and if Rick can make it in time to save him, Minmay, and the people of Macross. As Minmay continues to sing, she's startled by two gigantic battle pods at the back of the theater, their weapons silent as they pause there, unmoving. Kyle encourages Minmay to keep singing, and as she does, they realize it must be why the pods have ceased their attack. But a stray blast from behind them hits the stage lighting above Minmay. Kyle is able to push her out of the way and takes a hit from the light, injuring him. As the Zentradi witness this, they stare at the hurt Micronians, who look so very much like themselves. The damage, the fires, and they realize they may be destroying the very wonders they'd heard so many rumors about. Yet without the singing, they begin to move, searching for new targets. Before they get far, Skull One descends heroically from the air, taking them down as Rick heads towards the amphitheater. Rick pauses to take in the level of destruction all around. Max radios him, asking how things are looking in his sector. He simply responds, bad. Max is doing his best to clean up, taking down every challenger who comes at him. His maneuvers catching the eye of Miria, who instantly recognizes this blue Micronian mecha and the skills it now displays. Rick continues towards the amphitheater, running a gauntlet of endless laser fire and no end of enemy pods, carving his path to rescue Minmei from this hell the Zentradi have wrought. <laughs> <laughs>